Well, first of all, I'd like to reiterate the thanks to, to Skepticamp, to Brian. Uh, it's a great opportunity to all the other presenters that stood up in front of people and spoke things to support skepticism and humanism. I really appreciate it. I also want to make a little distinction. My, my program is a little bit more humanism than skepticism, but I assure you that there is a huge overlap. So uh, it, it should be uh, of much interest to you today. What I'm talking about today is a uh, humanist handbook for military personnel. So what that, may, what that will provide is a good introduction for young, young service members out in the military about what it is to be a humanist and a skeptic and how to understand the world around them. Because a lot of the service members in the military, they're very young, first time away from home, first time they ever met an atheist or a skeptic or a humanist. This may be their first introduction to our community, their first introduction to a way to think differently. And in a lot of cases, they're school age. You know, they may be in the military, you may be in college, but as, you go, as I go through this talk, at the end, I'm gonna ask, you know, what do you think? What other ideas do you have? This is, this is intended to be an introduction to what I'm doing so that you can provide feedback about how I should maybe do it a little bit better or what interesting things I could add based on your experience, what you would look for. And I wanna let you know, we're out there. You know, atheists and foxholes are out there. Atheists, humanists, skeptics, all people from all different areas. There's a lot of people in the military and a lot of those people are us. We are, we are certainly not an insignificant minority. We're a significant minority. I wanna tell you that the Department of Defense statistics, information that they've provided, uh, that I've surveyed from multiple different sources, show that there are more atheists, just the atheists, not even the humanists or the skeptics or agnostics, more than Muslims or Buddhists or Jews and, or Hindus. So it's not a lot, but it's more than all the people who aren't Christian. So, so think about that. There's a lot of people out there that need this help and, and throw that in people's face the next time they say, oh, well, you guys are just a fringe. We're not. I want to talk to you a little bit about this. The, the context of this is within my organization, the Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers. It's a national organization that supports atheists and humanists in the military. As you see, we, we reach out to chaplains. We have members around the world. Uh, we try to support local groups and local opportunities like this. We help the military to improve their training by better understanding atheists and humanists. And then we have publications like this humanist handbook. There's also one in the back there that provide you know, information, just what we have on kind of a three-page pamphlet. And I'm trying to expand that to more of a 200-page booklet. So it goes in this area. You see that moving animation on the screen? I want to warn you that there's some animation in this. I normally don't get into it, but hopefully it doesn't make anybody nauseous. All right, so I want to give you a little bit of background as well. This is intended to be a quick presentation, so I'm going to be very, very short here. But when you join the military, if you should ever choose, or anybody that you, you know that has joined the military, when they went to sign up for the military, they had lots of access to Christian materials. I'd say religious materials, but it's Christian. I, I just want to be, you know, call it what it is. I don't have anything against Christians, but it's the Christian materials. When they went to join, when they went to fly away to this new area, you know, they have stress, first time away from home. Mm -hmm. They had all sorts of Bibles everywhere being handed to them. When they showed up at training, you know, every Sunday. When they left training and went to their next portion of training. When they showed up at their unit. Every day, everywhere, all around them. They've got all sorts of access to materials especially, you know, these Bibles. And they're not bad. You know, if you're a Christian, you, you have a lot of free time in the military. They work you hard, but there's a lot of free time too. And they've got something to read. They've got something to connect with, something to remind them of a supportive community, something to, you know, that they can develop their values and study and understand where they're coming from and become, you know, better Christians in this case. That's not necessarily the worst thing in the world. I think they abuse a little bit of power on this, but what have we done in the humanist community to provide a similar resource to our people. You know, what have we done to collect, you know, the perfect little booklet as an introduction, something that's fun to read, something that's interesting to read, something that helps people become better atheists and humanists based on their values, on their character, on their terms. I just want to make a quick note. You see this, this Bible on the, on the right? That's got all the logos of special forces, the toughest killers in the military. You know, we don't, we don't necessarily plan to reiterate that activity because if you're in a nation that's conducting a war against an almost exclusively Muslim population, the last thing you want to do is 
hand around Bibles with Special Forces logos, it's a very good recruiting tool. So this is a bit of a scary thing that we're, I don't want to overlook that bit of an issue. But what we're talking about here today is how we can pull the good part about that program out and help out our people. So who should do it? I mean, should the chaplains do it? That's you know, how they reached out and got those materials. Different people involved in, in senior places in the military. Now, one example of what they've done, they've got this virtual spiritual fitness center. All right, they're missing us already. You know, sometimes we can work in this term spirituality, but it's not really our term. It's something that misses a lot of people who are us. And there's a lot of it, other issues. This is a chaplain website that's intended to reach everybody to support everybody. They talk about atheism and it, you know, they put some ehow.com and about.com links up. That's how they're trying to help us out. You know, they're real good with the Christian links. They've got hundreds of links to hundreds of sites. They've got direct phone numbers to focus on the family. No problem. They're doing a good job where they have expertise. But for us, they're not reaching out. They're not accepting support. I tried for, for months to reach out. I spoke to them. I said, here's very important changes you can make to better represent us in our community. And they chose not to do it. They said, hey, our tech guy's busy. Sorry, he, he, he's been out for a couple of days. So I just did it for him. Right? You can find this on the MAP website, militaryatheist.org. Click over to the Chaplain Services Center. We took out all the constitutional violations. We put all the religions on equal footing. You know, everybody has their ehow.com and their about.com links. And instead of how to become a Christian, we put how to live as a Christian. So if you're already one, you know, this is how to live as. So there's equal links, equal sources, and other references to established groups. It also has links to us, you know, humanist organizations, atheist organizations, skeptic organizations. In the inspiration section, it's not just chicken soup for the soul. It's not just the religious link. It's Hubble telescope in images. You know, it's uh, symphony of science, you know, with with uh, Sagan talk, things like that, talking about the world. These are things that are inspirational to a lot of people. So sometimes, again, you have to do it yourself. And I think this is a case where we're going to have to do it ourselves. They're not going to make an alternative to the Bible for us, for our people to read and grow and learn. So the last thing I want to do is uh, reinvent the wheel. I don't want to make a new, you know, a new book. You know, we've got a letter to a Christian nation. You know, but as you look at all these books, there, there are some downsides. You know, we can't have just one specific area. And then when you think about handing it out, you've only got a couple hundred pages to work with before, before things get too large to carry around. You know, Good Without God, that's actually a pretty, pretty good reference. But, but on the other hand, it's, it's still a larger book. There's a lot of things in there. There's, it touches a lot of areas. So we're going to make one. Now, it's an entry-level, comprehensive, and fun reference. And it should represent, this is a humanist symbol. Again, this is a little bit more humanist than skeptic. What kind of humanist should we have? <laughs> All right, guy? Who, 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 knows, who knows where that's from? All right, old comic book reference, evil learning. But that's not what we don't want to be evil learning humanists, right? We want to be the happy guy. So the philosophy that we put together, it's, it's got to be positive in the military community. This is not a college campus or the street or the media where you can be extremely candid and maybe a bit mocking and bashing of somebody else's beliefs. You may think they're nonsense. Maybe that's okay in the general population. But these people work together every day side by side. In order to be included in the military hierarchy, in the military programs, in those support programs, then it's fair for us to put our best foot forward and to avoid questioning of religion, but talk about the values and the positive character and positive community that we do have. But what, how do we do that? I mean, I'm not the pope, right? The atheist pope or something. They talk about this conspiracy theory, and I try to remind them that you know, we, don't, we don't collect. We don't clump together in groups. We don't herd. Uh, we say herding cats, right? You know, it's more like herding a pride of lions. They're very strong about these ideas. I mean, even humanism and humanism, right? What, do we capitalize it or not? I mean, these are questions that, I, that if one were to approach and to have a, a primary fundamental, fundamental reference, of kind of a found, foundational introduction to atheist community, the humanist community, what, you know, what should it look like? And I've tried to be fair about it, working with all these other organizations. And 
when the first edition comes out, I'll get all the complaints. And then the second edition can come out the next, the next year. We're progressive, not fundamentalist, so we're allowed to change, <laughs> right? Because change gets better, especially when we input, invite others. So normally this is where I'd ask for some feedback, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to give you the answer. <laughs> all right. If anybody has any objections, you know, don't question my authority. So the first foundational, the first section is scientific naturalism. Now, I put a couple pictures up here just, just for the feeling, the idea of you know, what we want to try to get, get across. So in scientific naturalism, I have Darwin's Tree of Life, the sketches he made. For him, from his viewpoint, he had to really overcome what he already knew to be true in order to see the world how it was. And that was something that was not only inspirational for himself, but also inspirational for really the entire world. So that's, that's the first section. Second is human-based rational ethics. And this is a nice picture, globalresearch.ca. You know, I, I didn't find a better picture, so I just stole theirs, free advertising for them. But it's not about making humans dominant or exploiting the power that we have over other species. It's about us being the only option. There's nobody else out there to help, so we have to be the best that we can. We have to find the best answers amongst them amongst ourselves to support each other and to support the environment. And the last thing, making meaning. This is a stamp for Mary Curie, Nobel Prize for Chemistry, an inspiration not only for those who benefited from her studies, but for women around the world. She really made something out of her life, found something that made a difference. And as we look, as we look at that example, we know that whether it's the big crunch or the big freeze or the big rip, the world's going to end in the fullness of time. Nothing really matters. You know, and in 100 years or 200 years from now, you know, probably we'll all be dead. And that's, that's, that's a reality. But that doesn't mean that between now and tomorrow or between now and 10 years from now, we can inspire a lot of enjoyment for ourselves individually, for our families, for our communities, for the greater world around us, and leave a legacy that makes a difference. So that's, that's the third important stool. In addition, we have an introduction to the inspiring community we have around, around the world. People just don't understand what else is out there. We have inspiration through humor and poetry, music and art. We don't want to be, you know, just put out the right answers, you know, a list of logical fallacies and, and think that people are going to be plugged into the community well. And the last thing is the appendices. That's, that's where the log logical fallacies go. We don't want to miss that part. But these, these things together, think about this, you know, as we, get, as we get towards the end and I start asking for questions, these are the different areas that I think allow for bite-sized buckets for a couple of hundred pages to introduce young troops to humanism and skepticism, plug them into a community that they already want to opt into, but they ne haven't necessarily ever plugged, in, plugged into. I want to talk about the individual sections just to give you a, a bit more detail. Talking about scientific naturalism, this is scientific method, understanding the world, assigning certainty according to the weight of the evidence. There's a lot of skepticism in here, along with the joy of reality. The comfort that one gets in saying, well, I know these things, and I kind of know these things, and I don't know anything about these other things. There's nothing embarrassing about that, and there's certainly no need to put in false answers or made up answers in place of a legitimate and honest lack of evidence. Second thing is the, with ethics, we have our evolved empathy as social animals. We have all the tools, deontology, utilitarianism, virtue ethics, all of these tools that we have over thousands of years of philosophical development. We have our experiences. We have our use in actual, actual application. Maybe some scenarios that they would benefit from as well as people say, well, how can you be good without God? And then you fight the urge to say, well, screw off. You know, it's a stupid question. You know, you can actually, if, if you have a discussion, actually talk a about a little bit more detail what that means. And with making meaning, you know, finding your perspective, talking about questions of ultimate concern. What happens when I die? Why should I even care? You know, what happened when my friend died? This is a very significant problem in the military. You know, what does it really mean when you serve, when you talk about people who know they have one life and who have put that life on the line to defend their values, to defend the nation? Talking about milestones and celebrations as well. We don't do a good job in our community of talking about when people you know, come of age, when people start living their adult life, 
you know, we have marriages and things like that. But a lot of these ceremonies and celebrations are taken from, you know, archaic celebrations for property-based marriage and lives that ended at 30 or 40. You know, we don't really celebrate enough other ways to talk about movement between different careers, different jobs, different life situations, and connections with others. Talk about community, international and national organizations. I mean, this, this is kind of, a, kind of a small picture, but when you look at that picture there, that's 11 organizations that have all come together, 10 organizations that have come together as the Secular Coalition for America. And that's just one example. That doesn't even talk about all of the national organizations that are out there. A lot of people, especially young people, have no conception of all of the ways that the non-theist community has come together to show, to put forth a concerted effort to help out kids and to help out students and to help out, you know, and to develop humanist philosophy and to talk about science and reason. Ways they can connect in their local area and in their national area. And this is very important because when you're in the military, you have a hierarchy and a very right-wing, very Christian culture, and people want to know that they're not alone. And that's what this, this portion of the book, and really the book itself, speaks to, I think, as much as anything. You know, you're not alone. Other people are like you. It's okay to be the way you are, and you should study more so you can be better as yourself. Comics and humor, I'll, I'll, I'll let you squint at, the, uh, squint at the XKCD up here. You know, that's where we'll definitely pull a, a couple of XKD KCD comics into there. But having some fun in there as well is important. Poetry, a little Tim mentioned. Uh, some of the paintings, you know, photos from the Hubble telescope. We want to try to put that in there as well so it's not a philosophical effort. So it's not just about, you know, how right we are about how the world is. You know, it's not just a bunch of ethical scenarios. There's some fun in there, some, some things about, you know, even meditation and things like that so people can have a more touchy-feely approach because that's, that's important. That's part of us. So this is the last slide. Uh, we've got a great story to tell and a great audience to reach. And I really hope you can help me a little bit, of, uh, a little bit with framing this and forming this and keep an eye at the Military Atheist website, Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers. It's militaryatheist.org. This and other programs will be featured as time progresses, and I'm always open to feedback on this. We also have Facebook, Twitter, and RSS feeds if you want to plug those into your, your browser. At this point, again, I want to thank... Uh, thank our host, Brian Gregory, take some questions from the audience, and remind everybody there are thank you notes in the back to be provided to service members overseas, members of, the, members of our organization that, that are looking for support and appreciation from, from back here at home. So thank you very much. especially in the last year. We have members on over 400 installations and ships around the world, thousands of members representing the tens of thousands of atheists and humanists that are in the military. Um, I just had a, a question about how you can re um, reconcile the sort of tenets of humanism in an organization whose primary purpose is to train its members to go out of the yeah. yeah, this came up, I was at the International Humanist and Ethical Union Conference, the World Congress on Peace in August, and even, you know, and I, and I asked a lot of the pacifists that were there, that were, you know, on stage discussing pacifist, you know, arguments. First of all, we had an agreement that, you know, you make a good point, there are certain wars, especially current ones, that are very problematic for a lot of reasons. So, and the answer is that humanists, primarily in the civilian leadership, who make decisions about what the military personnel do. We need to encourage them to engage in war when it's necessary for humanitarian reasons, not for imperialistic or religious or corporate reasons. And that positive influence that the humanist community can have on the military and the civilian leadership of the military is the best, you know, the best response. But even from the most pacifist 
uh, argument, you know, the personnel that were speaking, none of them said categorically that no humanist should join the military or that the military should never be used outside the borders of a country. There are humanitarian reasons to do that, and you know, I think that that's the response there. Um, so, in terms of different quotes, inspiring quotes, have you uh, considered looking at what the founding fathers have said? Um, because I know that a lot of them were very, you know, big on reason and even um, questioning of um, not necessarily they weren't necessarily atheists, but they were a lot of their deists, and they were um, they were going to questioning of, I guess, Christianity. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so the answer to your question, yes, the founders, I'll say. You know, as opposed to the founding fathers, there were mothers in there too. So uh, the founders will be a source. Yeah, Thomas Jefferson has a lot of good quotes. James Madison, you know, so and uh, certainly Ben Franklin. Oh, so the question was whether whether we were going to use the founders as uh, as sources for inspiring quotes. And again, Ben Franklin, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, a lot of those. Thomas Paine certainly will will be included in that list of quotes. I was wondering if you've um, encountered much hostility or pushback um, from any in military organization. Yes. I can. <laughs> Have I encountered any openness and acceptance? Yes. Um, I'd say that's you know this is more of a nine to one, ten to one ratio. Um, I get a lot. I get a lot of you know pushback and a lot of. Um, People, people haven't been open. Like I said, that, that example of the website is, is the primary example. Uh, I've offered very reasonable suggestions. And in case any of you were wondering, the Air Force Academy has been very good about accepting suggestions. Got a long way to go, but they're, they have made a lot of strides in the last year or so. You know, there's an there's a update that's going to come out on the site here in the next week probably about that. But at what rank are you, I mean? All ranks. So we're, we're doing from, from the lowest level, the, the captains and lieutenants that are helping out the privates, you know, and the sergeants on the line level, and I've been all the way, you know, I've been, there, there's been a little bit of lobbying in Congress, that's not really what we do, or C3, but I've been, I've reached out to generals and at the Department of Defense, at all the uh, chiefs of chaplains in the services, so at every level in the military. And so they've had every opportunity to say yes, by all means, humanists and atheists and humanists are people too, we would like your help to understand because none of our chaplains are you. So please come in and help us out. They've had every opportunity to do that. They have, they have very, very seldom taken advantage of that opportunity. So that's unfortunate. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. So you make you make a good point about the the influence of chaplains in the military, and we've got two re, two retired Navy people as part of you know kind of the organizers and supporters of the event. Yeah, the Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers feels that the chaplains provide an important, an important role. They're not doing very well by the humanists in the military, and we have a chaplain outreach program that my organization runs to help them to understand and provide for atheists and humanists better than they already do. We also have endorsement programs in place, so if there are any candidates that are interested in being chaplains in the military, being humanist chaplains, we can, do, we can support that from an administrative perspective after, of course, all of the education and vetting is done properly. So both for humanist chaplains and to help chaplains support humanists, we, we have programs in place, long-standing programs in place to help make that happen. Well, it's not the way it works. There are billets for chaplains. Chaplain billets are not based on religious demographics. So theoretically, yes. Yes. I guess this is sort of a follow-up to those two questions, but when you, when you have your handbook, how do you see getting it out there? Are you going to have your, you know, the existing military members at various levels just, because you said, you know, there are Christian materials everywhere. Right. How, how do you plan on kind of distributing this to get it maybe in the hands of people who are not? Well, it's the same, it's the same distribution channel. So there are two, two primary distribution channels. The first is <coughs> Organizations that want the materials out fund the printing, fund the fund the distribution, and mail them out to the units. And they just put them All right. Out that, I mean, I and they they mail them, them to their own people, and then their own people make them available. Okay. All right. The second thing is, is chaplains have have certain a certain amount of funds, you know, a relatively small amount of funds, but they have funds to make available materials to their personnel. They they have 
They have Bibles, they have Torahs, they have Korans, they have more Bibles, they have other Bibles, and then they have some additional Bibles. And then they have, <laughs> they have the Daily Bread, they have Watchtower, they have um, you know, any number of pamphlets and materials. So, so the Christian community does a very good job of making sure that chaplains are flush with materials for their own personnel. And, and I encourage any of you here that would like to see this program succeed, understand that printing costs and distribution costs will be part of our responsibility in a majority of cases, as long as the chaplains also do their part to fill their stock with their materials, providing a fair and even distribution of the, of the funds that they're spending, and not having 100 Bibles and a Koran in the corner. All right, so. My name is Dom, and uh, I go to Howard University, and so I would like to think that the population or demographics that you seem to be immersed in is similar in the religious aspects at Howard, uh, you know, it being a historically black college. And I am certainly a full-blown atheist, 100%. So uh, I definitely have conversations all the time with individuals on campus who come up to me and question me, you know, why do I, why am I an atheist? What, you know, some of them even said, I've never been an atheist before. And there is a really odd question that, uh, when you were giving your presentation, I thought you might be interested in. I was asked one time, uh, someone pulled me aside and he said, you know, I want to ask you something about atheism. And I said, oh my gosh, like, what do I do? I've never been in this situation before. And he said, is, athe you know, is atheism another religion? And that really, you know, struck me because I definitely don't consider atheism to be a religion to me, a religion, um, in my definition, is something is, is, is a type of organization that proselytizes to get more people to believe what they believe. And I'm not saying that yours is in any sense, but... Right, so, so your question is, you know, is atheism a religion, which is one of those perpetual questions. Well, no, it, it's not really a question, it's just something that I thought of might help you when you come to your strategy is... Well, the response, so the response I give, and this comes up a lot because... Uh, it, it just comes up a lot, the question, well, aren't you guys just a religion? And I can't, representing the community, again, being the honest broker of what the atheist and humanist community feels, I can't say, well, just yes, right? There are certain definitions within the military. There's one definition of religion, and then there's a test for religion. And both of those we technically would fit in, you know, or many of our organizations would technically fit in because they talk about a deeply held set of beliefs. They don't require faith. You know, belief in the absence of evidence or belief contrary to evidence, and they don't require supernatural beliefs. Okay, so, so when you pull, when you think about all the religions you know about, you pull out super, the supernatural component and the faith component, it starts to look a little bit more like our approach to positive ethics, values, community, scientific naturalism, ethics, making meaning. You know, it starts to look a lot more like that when you start to pull out the, the switch that turns off critical thinking. And when you start to pull out the, the appeal to supernaturalism that's not there. So, so that's the answer that I give them is, hey, you can call us religion if you want, right? We have certain components, but understand that's not our word. And if you're talking about faith in the absence of evidence or supernaturalism, then that's 100% not us. That doesn't qualify. So that's, that's, that's how that's approached there. The, just the one thing that I noticed that I feel might be missing is that if I was in the market for a religion, and I already had one, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I wanted to see about another one, and the other one certainly had a completely drastic different ending than mine does, you know, if I already have one, you know, and I'm safe with that one, then why would I go to another one? And so I think, to me, what it seemed like the, the, the real issue with that question is, is, you know, to push the idea that atheism is not a religion, period. You know, because it's, because if, I don't, like I said, it, it seemed like he was just, the, the way he defined his question made me think that he, he's looking for a religion, whatever my answer is to him. Right, so, you know, again, this is one of those ubiquitous questions out there, and, and you have the opportunity in that situation to break down this word, because religion is, is one of those very charged words. So you have the opportunity to break down what they're talking about and what you're talking about, use different words, come to an understanding, and then 
you know, maybe you can connect with that individual, but it's really hard to expand that to kind of national policy and doctrine, right. as it were. So I think we're out of time here. Thank you, thank you again very much for your time. <laughs>